Welcome to Gala Shields Baptist Church. Uh, if you're visiting us for the first time, a special welcome. Please do stay at the end and join us for tea and coffee so we can uh, get to know you a little better. And welcome to those on Zoom and also to those who will be watching on YouTube later in the week. Hello, um, my name's Rona. I'm one of the deacons here. We're starting today a new series on worship. So we all have our own preconceptions of what worship is. So let's just start with some worship without further ado. to worship and lift up your holy and precious name for there is no other name but the name of Jesus and I thank you father for your son for with him father I believe life would be impossible you are almighty God and Lord it just gives me great pleasure to lift up and worship your holy and precious name let our words and our songs be a sweet sound in your ear this morning father and let your holy spirit move amongst us now I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Take a seat, everyone. So that's probably what most of you think worship is, isn't it? It's standing in church singing rousing songs, praising the Lord. But I'm sure that there are a few of you that have a completely different idea of what worship is. And I wonder if some of you might share that. Now, I have the microphone, or if it's only short, then shout it out and I'll repeat it back so that those on Zoom and those that need it will, will hear it over the microphone. So I think Ewan's going to go into this in more detail later. Maybe he'll correct some myths or maybe he'll take some of the things that you say. I don't know. 
But what do you think worship is? Give me some ideas. Serving other people. Not the same as praise. Some Not the same as praise, although there is some overlap. Okay. Anyone else? Drawing near to God and listening to what he says. Being in his presence. Being in his presence. Rare. rare? Prayer. Or prayer. <laughs> I was going to say, I hope it's not rare. <laughs> Otherwise, we're in trouble. Prayer. Yeah, that's what. I think it's living our whole life um, in a way on God. So living our whole life in a way that honours God. Anyone else? Recognising our His holiness and our sinfulness. Recognising His holiness and our sinfulness. One at the back there. Honouring and worshipping the Lord. Sharing fellowship with others. <coughs> Sacrifice. Communion. Communion. Any more? So there's a real mix there, isn't there? You know, everyone has their own idea of what worship is. And it's going to be quite hard, I think, for us to look at it and try and really define it because it is such a big part of our faith but why do we worship um i'm going to turn to david who for argument's sake probably is one of the biggest worshipers in the bible in that he wrote many of the psalms which many of them are songs of praise and in first chronicles he prays this uh, this is first chronicles 29 he says Praise be to you, Lord, the God of our father Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. Yours, Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the majesty and the splendor, for everything in heaven and earth is yours. Yours, Lord, is the kingdom. You are exalted as head over all. Wealth and honor come from you. You are the ruler of all things, and in your hands are strength and power to exalt and give strength to all. Now, our God, we give you thanks and praise your glorious name. But isn't that a great summing up of why we should worship God? And we're going to continue to do that now. And I'd say over the next four weeks, we're going to be looking at worship in the same way that we looked at prayer this time last year. And examining it and seeing what we do and what other people do and what we can do differently. So let's go back a few years and let's worship God by singing a traditional hymn, which for many people is a form of worship. There are all kinds of different songs of praise and we're going to try and delve into some of them over the coming weeks. As a musician, of course, music is very important to me. That's my way of worship. That's what I think of as worship. So let's all stand and sing together one of the great hymns, Be Thou My Vision.
Now, normally we'd come to a part in the service where we do intercessory prayers now, which is often when we pray for other people or other situations. But as this is the fifth Sunday of the month and therefore an anomaly, I'm going to do things differently this morning. <laughs> so instead of a time of intercessory prayer, and because we're looking at worship, I thought we could all worship in prayer together as a congregation. Now, for those of you on Zoom, this is your opportunity perhaps to have some quiet praise and prayer by yourself. Listen to what's going on. But this isn't necessarily about hearing what everyone is praying. This is about speaking those prayers to God. And if you can't hear what someone's saying, God will hear. If you don't want people to hear, now's your opportunity to whisper something to God, a word of thanks. It doesn't matter if you talk over each other. Let's just bring our prayers this morning to God. So by all means, shout them loud as you like or keep them in your head. But let's have a time of all praying and praising God together. Let's be thankful for what God has given us. So I'll start and I'll finish, okay? In the middle is up to you, okay? Lord, thank you that you are the amazing God that we can worship. We thank you for all the big things and all the tiny little things that you do for us or that you have created in this world, Lord. Often it's so difficult to get bogged down with the negatives and what is wrong, Lord. But you have given us so many good things. And even if we're struggling to see it, Lord, help us this morning to find one little thing that we can be thankful for. Lord, take all the prayers that are going to be prayed this morning, whether silently, whether whispered, whether shouted, whether sung out loud, Lord, it doesn't matter. They all mean the same to you, Lord. So we come to you now with our prayers of thanks. Lord, let these prayers rise like incense to heaven. And listen to your people, we pray, Lord. We all have silent prayers on our hearts as well, Lord, and we lift those to you as well this morning. But we worship you, Lord, as a God who answers prayer. And we thank you. Amen. Now in this quiet of prayerfulness, let's stay seated as we sing the next song. And you don't need to sing it. Sometimes worship is about listening and letting things wash over. So if you want to sing, sing. If you want to sit silent, sit silent. This is what we're looking to do is look at what worship is. Try new things. So let's Come to God in worship again.
Bible readings. The first one is from Psalm 51, verses 10 to 19. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast heart within me. Do not cast me away from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and uphold me by your generous Spirit. Then I will reach, then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners shall be converted to you. Deliver me from the guilthood of bloodshed, O God, the God of my salvation, and my tongue shall sing aloud of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth shall show forth your praise. For you do not require sacrifice, or else I would give it. You do not delight in burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. These, O God, you will not despise. Do good in your good pleasure to Zion. Build the walls of Jerusalem. Then you shall be pleased with sacrifices of righteousness, with burnt offerings and whole burnt offerings. Then they shall offer bulls on your altar. Second reading is Romans 12, verses 1 and 2. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be confronted to the, conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is good and acceptable to the perfect will of God. For their classes this morning. So let's say a quick prayer over them and their teachers as they leave. <laughs> Lord, thank you for the children and the young people amongst us. 
Bless this time this morning as they learn more about you. Give wisdom and the words to say to those that are teaching them, Lord, and be with them this morning. And we also pray for you, and as he comes now to bring us your word this morning, that you would also put your words on his lips and that he may speak to us anew this morning. Amen. Amen. Rona, thank you so much for leading us so far in our service this morning as we consider worship. And thank you to all of you as well for your participation in the service so far, contributing and shouting out um, prayers and shouting out what is worship as well. As we come to God's word this morning, let's just take a moment to still our hearts and come before him. Holy Spirit, living breath of God, breathe new life in us this morning through the power of your word. Jesus, would you draw us closer and closer to you this morning as we look to you. God, would you open our eyes and open our ears to your love for us. And may we hear from you and meet with you through our time together now as we worship you this morning. Amen. Amen. So, we're starting our new series on worship. And as Rona said, this will be a little bit similar to our series on prayer last year, where we looked four weeks at prayer. You'll remember that we did things a little bit differently at times. We explored the topic and the theme, not only in our uh, time listening to the sermon, but also in our whole worship service. And this series will be no different. But before I go any further, I must... Um, give a shout out to this book, Why Worship? Insights into the Wonder of Worship, edited by Tim Hughes and Nick Drake. Because now Tim Hughes, that'll be a name that some of you are, are quite familiar with. He's written quite a lot of worship songs. Um, but this is a book that I'll be drawing on uh, quite heavily throughout this series. So uh, just so I don't get uh, called out for plagiarism or anything like that, I'm flagging it up right from the get-go. It's edited by Tim Hughes and Nick Drake, but really it is a whole bunch of people, worship artists, worship leaders, church leaders, and biblical scholars, giving their take, bringing their, um, their part to the conversation on what is worship. And I'll be drawing upon that heavily throughout this series. At the end of last year, Spotify gave me my 2022 wrapped. Now, if any of you listen to Spotify, uh, you'll be aware that at the end of the year, they often kind of give you a bit of a, a reveal on the kind of music you've been listening to, the top songs that you listen to over and over and over and over again, and the artists that you've been listening to as well. And I like to think of myself as a very varied, broad individual with an eclectic music taste, with um, yeah, some real complexity to me. Uh, but it turns out that I only listened to worship music as my top five artists for the whole of last year. And number one in particular was this collective called Poor Bishop Hooper. It's a husband and wife, and they write songs together. And they took on, about four years ago, they took on a mammoth task where for the next three years, they were going to release a song based on a psalm every week. Every week on Wednesday, they would release their next song on their Every Psalm project. They actually got to 171 songs by the end of the project, which finished uh, towards the end of last year, because for Psalm 119, which if you know is absolutely huge, they had about 20 um, songs per um one for each section of that psalm as well. So you can imagine a huge project. 
And that was what I spent a lot of time last year listening to, not least because I read through the Psalms. And it was great after I'd read a Psalm to just go to this playlist and to listen to their take on it. It's reflective. Um, it's, it's just uh, quite stripped back as well. It's not big choral music and it's quite varied actually. So I would recommend the Every Psalm Project to you. But as I say, most of my um, worship last year was music. But as we've already flagged up, worship is not just music. So the question I asked this morning is, what kind of worship? What kind of worship do you like? That's one question we could consider. But I think first we need to ask ourselves, what kind of worship does God like? What kind of worship does God look for? Throughout why worship, these verses from Romans 12, verse 1 to 2, pop up time and time again. You could say they're kind of the theme verses for the book. And this morning I want us to focus especially on Romans 12, verse 1. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. I know that we all like to memorize John 3, 16, but if there was another verse I could encourage you to memorize, it would be this one. Because there is so much depth to this verse and the verse after it as well, starting, do not conform to the pattern of this world. Some of you might even be able to say it and it just trips off the tongue, but there is so much depth to this verse. And you could probably spend the whole series just sitting in this one verse, but don't worry, I'm not going to do that. This morning, instead, I want us to focus on these three words, living, holy, and pleasing to God. You see, in the NIV, they translate it as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. But all three of those words, living, holy, and the phrase pleasing to God, they're all equal with one another. You are to offer your bodies, Paul is saying, as a sacrifice, one which is living, one which is holy, and one which is pleasing to God. So as we ask the question, what kind of worship is God looking for? We're going to take our cue from Romans 12, verse 1. Worship that is living, holy, and pleasing to God. Now for Paul's first hearers, for the church in Rome, for them to hear you're to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, was in many ways very familiar. A sacrifice, yep, we know what that's about. If they're um, non-Jews uh, in their Roman and um, Greek culture, they would have been familiar with the idea of going to a temple and offering an animal as a sacrifice to please the gods. Of course, it was a bit of a toss up about which gods you chose. You had to choose one. You couldn't try and please them all. And you just had to hope that you'd chosen the right one. Because if you hadn't, who knows what would happen. So for Paul's non-Jewish readers, they would have been familiar with the idea of sacrifice. Same for the Jewish leaders as well. They would have been familiar with the idea of sacrifice as well. You'll remember in um, autumn, we looked at Exodus and the Old Testament and the stories from um, Jewish scriptures, which speak and command even God's people to bring animal sacrifice to God. But an animal sacrifice, though living at the start, I'm afraid wouldn't be living for very long. That's the nature of the sacrifice that the animal would be put to death and its blood would be used to cleanse the people from their sins so that they were not called upon to offer that same price. So when Paul says a living sacrifice, and when Paul says to offer yourselves, 
there's something very new about what Paul is saying to his hearers here. They're familiar with the idea of bringing an animal to cleanse them of their sins in order that God can be in their space, that God can dwell with them and that they can dwell with God. Or as somebody put it earlier, that they can draw near to God. That's familiar. But bringing themselves, bringing their bodies as a living sacrifice, not a dead sacrifice, a living sacrifice. That is a vivid image and that is a very new concept for Paul's hearers. And it's one that should be new for us as we hear it again and again and again. It's one that should spark new life in us because our worship is not to be dead. Our worship is not to just be for a singular time. Our worship is not like a task that we do where we bring an animal to God and then we tick that off and we get on with the rest of our day. No, our worship is a gift. Our worship is a gift that we get to participate in because of what God has done for us. Our worship is a living sacrifice. It is charged with life, with passion. It embodies everything that we are. That's why Paul says to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. And if you think that's too physical, well, it's accompanied by the next verse by being renewed in your minds. Should remind us of what Glenn was talking to us last week. Love the Lord your God's with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Folks, what kind of worship is God looking for? All of life worship. Our whole bodies, our whole minds. That means what we do, how we live. It means what we think how we speak, how we treat others. It's our emotions. It's our attitudes. It's the way we spend our time. It's the things we watch. And it's even how we sing on a Sunday morning. Not necessarily the quality of it. Don't worry. God's not judging you based on whether you feel like you're a strong singer or not. But it's our attitudes as we come to sung worship. Offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. Worship God with your whole life. And worship him with the passion of new life in Christ. Because we were made to worship. We were made to worship. To say that is to hit upon one of the questions that humanity has been asking since the dawn of time. It's a question that younger generations are asking today especially, they probably feel it more acutely. They, they wrestle with it almost on a daily basis. But it's a question that we all ask ourselves, albeit sometimes we push it to the back of our minds. What am I here for? What does it mean to be human? What is the meaning of life? What is my ultimate purpose? What is our ultimate purpose as human beings here on this earth? As I say, it's a question as old as time. 350 years ago, it was a question that was answered like this. In the Westminster Shorter Catechism, published in 1647, a instructional text that was written to help people understand what it means to be a Christian. 
The first question, right off the bat, the opening discussion is this question, what is the chief end of humankind? What are we here for? What is our purpose? What is our goal? Why are we here in the first place? To which they respond, the chief end of humankind is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. Worship isn't just something we do on a Sunday because we were made to worship God. Worship is how we live our whole entire lives. Our purpose is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. I love that especially, enjoy him forever. It's not duty, obligation, it's not reluctant, it's not dragging our feet, it's to enjoy God to enjoy him forever. Which begs the question, why does Paul need to urge us to do it? Look down at, at your Bibles, at Romans chapter 12, verse 1, and you'll see Paul says, therefore, I urge you, as Andrew read, I beseech you. Why does Paul need to urge us to do something that we were made for? You don't need to be urged to do something that you enjoy normally. You want to do it. I certainly don't need to be urged to eat that next slice of cake. If anything, I probably need to be urged the opposite. Why does Paul need to urge us to worship if we were made to worship? See, the question isn't necessarily will we worship? The question is what or who will we worship? That's what the story of the Bible tells us time and time again. As the Bible Project puts it, the melody, the recurring melody that appears countless times even in the first five books of the Bible, let alone the whole story of Scripture, the melody is that time and time again, God in his grace and in his goodness offers us life and we turn our backs on him and we worship other things. We worship our own decisions, our own wisdom, our own ability to choose what is good for us instead of trusting God's wisdom. That's the Garden of Eden repeated over and over and over. We worship our own idea of who God is. We confine him to a box. That's the golden calf story, where they make their own image of who God is, who rescued them out of Egypt, and they worship that instead of the God who is far bigger than they can imagine. We worship other gods, instead of the one true God. And so our worship is not holy, because holy means set apart. Holy means that we worship God and God alone. Just this week, I was reading of Elijah speaking to the people of Israel and telling them, how long how long are you going to dither between two opinions? How long are you going to worship the one true God and also worship this false God, Baal? How long will your worship of God be unholy? We are called to worship God with our whole lives and we are called to worship God alone to put him above all else, to put him above ourself. You could say today people want to answer what is the chief end of humankind with, the chief end of humankind is to glorify me and to enjoy myself and for me to enjoy life forever. Me 
me, me. God calls us to holy worship. God calls us to worship him alone. And finally, Paul says that our true and proper worship is a sacrifice which is pleasing to God. A sacrifice that is acceptable to God. You might be thinking at this point, this is the same God who is holy. This is the same God who is the one true God. How on earth can I know how to please him? How on earth could my worship be acceptable to God who is so much bigger than me? But God doesn't leave us in the dark when it comes to worship that is acceptable to him. In fact, as we just talked about earlier, one of the best worshippers in the Bible, David, who was responsible for writing so many of the Psalms, David, on his own journey from sin to repentance to trusting in God to renewal in God he discovered what kind of worship is pleasing to God apologies if you can't see that as well in Psalm 51 verse 10 he says create in me a pure heart O God because David knows that his heart has not been pure. He knows that his worship has not been holy. He's worshipped himself, his own entitlement, his own position. He's worshipped in selfishness. He's worshipped by doing what he wants to do, regardless of the costs to others, regardless of what God has to say about it. He knows that he has sinned. He opens Psalm 51 by saying, Have mercy on me, O God, crying out to God for forgiveness. And it's in that journey of coming to God and saying, God, I need you. God, I recognize my burden. God, I bring my burden of sin to you, as we did when we brought that stone to the foot of the cross two weeks ago. It is through that journey of repentance that he discovers in verse 17. My sacrifice, O God, is a broken spirit. A broken and contrite heart you, God, will not despise. We might think at this point that David's saying that God isn't really interested in sacrifices, which seems a bit strange because there's a whole book of the Bible dedicated to the sacrifices that God wants his people to give him. And yet in the very next verses, verse 18 and 19, David says, when you restore Jerusalem, then we will offer right sacrifices to you. So he's not saying that God isn't interested in sacrifice whatsoever. He's saying at this point on David's journey from sin to repentance, to new life, to trusting in God, to having his heart renewed. What God is looking for at this point is not sacrifice. What God is looking for at this point is not ritual. It's not rote. It's not just doing things for the sake of it. What God is looking for is David himself. What God is looking for is David's heart. And folks, what kind of worship is pleasing to God? It is wholehearted worship. It is us giving our whole lives, our whole selves, and above all, giving our hearts to God. That is the state by which we can draw near to God. When we recognize who we are, when we recognize our sin and our brokenness, when we recognize our needs of him, when we humble ourselves with a broken heart before God. 
At the end of our prayer week, we ask the question, what do you see and hear? I'm starting to see and hear a recurring theme in our services. For the last four weeks, independently of one another, we've stood up and we've essentially asked the question, what is the state of your heart? Galabaptist, I believe that God is calling us to wholehearted worship. To wholehearted worship. That means worshipping him with our whole hearts in our lives, including worshipping him with our whole heart on a Sunday morning. Even in the times when we sing and make music to the Lord. A broken and contrite heart you, God, will not despise. But all of this is done in view of God's mercy. Please don't forget the opening to Paul's words in Romans 12 verse 1. Because if we set out to do all this in our own strength, to worship God more in a living way, to, to get it right, to worship him and him alone, to, to be pleasing to him, to make sure that we were good enough and acceptable enough to come before God, then we have totally missed the point of what this kind of sacrifice is. This is not the sacrifice that cleanses you of your sins. This is not the sacrifice that makes it possible for you to draw near to God. This is not the sacrifice that allows you to know and experience anew God's love for you. God has already offered that sacrifice through his son, Jesus Christ, who has given a sacrifice that is once and for all, so that we don't have to offer animals year in, year out. We don't have to offer imperfect sacrifices because he has given a perfect sacrifice of his blood poured out on the cross for us. Jesus lived a holy and pure and sinless life because we are not capable of doing that. Though we are called to live that way, we will mess up. We will get it wrong in our attitudes, in our emotions, in our actions, in our deeds. We will not always be perfect. In fact, far from it. Jesus has offered that perfect sacrifice. A sacrifice that makes us acceptable and pleasing to God. A sacrifice that allows us to come into God's presence, to be welcomed into God's family. This is why Paul doesn't open Romans by saying, hey, good to see you, church in Rome. Right, first thing, you need to have worship that's living, holy and pleasing to God. No, Paul has spoken for 11 chapters all about God's mercy, all about God's grace. He's spoken of how you were dead to sin, but you are now alive in Christ. He's spoken of how you have passed through into new life with Christ. You spoke, he's spoken of how Christ being raised from the dead raises us from the dead to new life, eternal life in him. There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Hear those words, Galabaptists. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And there is nothing that can separate you from the love of God. Therefore, in view of God's mercy, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. Therefore, in view of God's love, respond with wholehearted love and devotion for him. This is your true and proper worship. 
one of the most significant moments in Scripture. One of the most significant moments of worship in Scripture. It's not a big fancy worship service. It's not lots of singing and dancing. It's not a gathering of thousands of people making a big song and dance. No, it is the act of one woman shortly before Jesus' death. The act of one woman who with a broken and contrite heart, who in response to all that Christ has done for her, though we don't know the ins and outs of what that is, but we can only guess from her wholehearted response and devotion, pouring expensive perfume, wiping Jesus' feet with her tears, preparing him for the roads that he is about to travel. That is one of the most significant acts of worship in the Bible. Tommy McNeil, in his book, Sleeping Giant, which I know uh, the Thursday night home group are uh, reading together, and I know some of you uh, have read or have been reading as well. He calls the church to worship God both throughout our lives and on our Sunday mornings. And we'll talk about that a bit more in week three of this uh, series. He calls the church to worship God with the attitudes of this woman. I'd like to invite the band up now uh, as we're about to sing our next song, our final song, Heart of Worship. And as you come to worship God this morning, hear these words. As you come to sing to God, to pray to God, to praise God, and maybe even to do business with God, to repent, to honestly tell God in your heart the sin in your life and the ways in which you have worshipped other things. Hear these words. Imagine being in the presence of Jesus. Imagine hearing him speak to us. Imagine being reminded of his love, experiencing it anew and being moved to worship him wholeheartedly. Because in doing so, you are imagining the attitude of heart of that remarkable woman of whom Jesus said, generations, for generations, any time this story is told, what this woman has done will be spoken of. Let's pray. A broken and contrite heart, you, God, will not despise. Lord Jesus, you will not cast us out. You will not Turn us away from you when we draw near to you with a broken and contrite heart. When we draw near to you in worship, you will not block your ears because you love us. You died for us. You have rescued us and brought us into new life with you. Lord Jesus, we are sorry for the times when we worship other things. We are sorry for when we worship ourselves, when we put ourselves above all else in this world, when we put ourselves above you. Help us to to come back to you, to draw near to you. 
not to scrub ourselves up and, and make sure that we're perfect and then to come to you, but to recognize with a broken and contrite heart, to recognize our need of you and to bring our hearts before you, asking, as David did, create in me a pure heart and renew a steadfast spirit within me. As we worship you, as we sing this song, may you create in us a new heart. Amen. Amen. Let's stand and let's close our service together by singing and coming back to the heart of worship. you would know the truth of these words in your own life. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Then I will teach transgressors your ways so that sinners will turn back to you. 
Deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed, O God, you who are God my saviour, and my tongue will sing of your righteousness. Open my lips, Lord, and my mouth will declare your praise. May we go from here declaring his praise and being renewed in the joy of our salvation in Jesus Christ our Lord, in whose name we pray. Amen. Amen.